Hey everybody, I'm Abby. Mr. Mike Chuck, people in the back, can you hear me? Yes, I got one yes. Anybody else? I only got one yes. You're in the back. You're not at all in the back. Come on. All right, people in the back are, I guess we're just busy. So, do you want to hear me? <laughs> Whatever. All right, um, whoa. Dude. All right, I'm actually going to start now. All right, so be before I dive in, I um, one of the things I really like about the closure community is that it uh, values the past and um, respects the past, and we want to build on the past. And we sort of recognize in this community that, that the work we do is enabled by prior work, and we stand on the shoulders of giants. And so I just recently got this t-shirt, and I want to use it as an excuse to sort of um, recognize some giants in computing that don't always get recognized. So Ada Byron Lovelace was the inventor of computer programming, and that was amazing. Uh, Jean Bartik helped invent little things like subroutines and nesting. Uh, Grace Hopper was instrumental in the development of high-level languages and compilers. And Margaret Hamilton led the team that developed the onboard flight software for the Apollo program, the Apollo space program that got us to the moon. So these are some of the giants that I think helped us get to where we are today. So it's sort of a comedy of errors just because I, but I really just want to give an experience report. You know, I was trying to do something with, with spec and I made a bunch of mistakes because I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, then eventually I think I figured something out that sort of works. And so I thought this might be useful for the people to see all the various ways that I messed up and that I eventually found something that seems to work. So I thought it might be interesting. And so there's a little bit of background on spec. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page uh, to, the, to the best that I can do in a minute or two on just what is spec. Um, so just, you know, where's, my, where's my speaker notes? This is bad. This is really bad. All right. So um, it's a library. And the goal of the library is, in the words of its author, to be closure's standard expressive, powerful, and integrated system for specification and testing. So that's the goal. That's pretty, you know, tight. So what this is, as I see it, as I understand it, is closure's answer to creating large, maintainable, sustainable systems with a lot of code without giving up on the dynamicity that we really need to cherish about closure. So it's still dynamic but we have ways to manage complexity on large-scale code bases over time. So, sort of like Clojure's alternative to types. Um, it's not a radically original idea, and the ideas in it are not radically original. Kiki himself acknowledged in his introduction to spec, almost nothing is about spec is novel. It has a lot of prior art, like uh, a schema library that was, it was and to some way still is popular in the Clojure community, so we call Herbert, Contracts, uh, RDF and, and schemas in general, the ideas of schemas in general, are, you know, sort of underlying ideas in spec. So, I see it as an excellent tool for specifying and validating data structures and testing and documenting functions. And that's how I use it. I use it for documentation, for testing, you know, it's right there. <laughs> so that's all the background I want to do right now. But I'll just pause for a second. Any questions about what spec just is and sort of what we might use it for? Is there anything unclear or did I miss something? Because we should do that now rather than, you know, keep going. Anybody? All right, well, raise your hand if, if you realize you have a question, okay? So let's just look at some code and maybe it'll make sense. Uh, but if it doesn't, please just shout out and we'll, and we'll fix that. Okay, so first let me explain First, let me explain my problem, the problem that I was experiencing and trying to solve. Um, come on. Great. Oh. This is what happens when you use a custom font for your, for your slides. Stay. Stay. This is my problem. Uh, all right. 
lesson learned. I won't use the custom font next time. Sorry. I think there's too much text on this slide and screwing everything up. All right, so this is a, this is actually YAML data structure. For those of you who aren't familiar with YAML, it's basically, you can think of it sort of like a superset of JSON with an alternate notation, but you know, conceptually it's almost the same thing. It's like just less symbols. Um, so this is a big data structure, a big data structure that I was working with. I'm writing a tool that generates uh, diagrams from some textual source. And this is an example of textual source. It's a YAML data structure. The YAML data structure describes a diagram and specifies a whole diagram and represents it. And you know, I have a program that will read this and render a diagram. That's that's like just the background. So this is a little too small for us to look at. So here's a, a little snippet of it. I've got here a root key called elements. The contents of elements is a, I guess, an array. Yeah, an array or sequence or whatever <clears throat> of, of, uh, of maps. So the root thing itself is a map or a dictionary or a hash or an object, whatever, you know, associative structure. Um, that's a root thing. It has two keys at the root, elements and styles. This is just a snippet. You know, and elements and styles both contain arrays, and those contents there are themselves associative structures, maps, whatever, maps. Um, and so, you know, we have a description of various elements that go into our diagram, and then we have a description of various styles that get applied to those elements. And, you know, it's pretty straightforward. The, the, the particulars here are not really that, that important to the specifics. But one thing, oh, and then here's a, a JSON version. For those of you who are more comfortable with JSON, it's the same exact thing, it's equivalent. And so we have an object with two properties. The pro values of the properties are arrays, and those arrays, the values in the arrays are objects with properties. So one of the challenges here in trying to, so I want to describe this whole thing. I want to describe an entire diagram in spec so I could do validation, so I could do testing, so I could do documentation, stuff like that. Uh, one of the challenges I encountered was this, uh, this type key that gets repeated in two different contexts. So in the top part, we have a, the, the child element. It's a, it's a map that represents an element. An element can have a type key, which can have certain values in it. There's an enumeration of certain values that can be in there. But you have, below that, you have styles. So you have an element, an object, or a map that represents a style, but also has a type key, and it also can have certain values. So there's an enumeration of certain set of values that are allowed there. And they're different, you know, so there's different types of, the types of elements, the set of types of elements, the set of types of styles, are not related. Um, oh, I've had the wrong line, I'm sorry. Under styles, I meant to highlight the type line. Can you see that? Yeah. All right, so it's a bug. Um, anyway, but type and type, just focus on that, because I can go back here. There's type and there's type, and I found that to be a problem. And what I found, as, as a neophyte, as someone who really likes spec, but hadn't had a lot of time to, to work with it, and hadn't really, wasn't really fluent with it, I found it perplexing. Um, and just challenging to get hands-on in terms of how to specify these different data structures in a single application um, and that both use type in the same place. It's like there's problems with namespaces and things like that, which maybe that makes sense, right? There's two things called type and they're kind of in the same place, in the same data structure. What are we gonna do? Well, why is this a problem? I wanna to try to explain why it was a problem and why it might be a problem in spec, or at least why it felt like a problem to me. Um, so it starts with the fact that, that one, the spec has a lot of strongly held opinions. Spec is very opinionated as a library, as a tool. It's extremely opinionated. And one of those strongly held opinions is that map keys, the keys that are maps, uh, should be namespaced. You shouldn't just say type. You should say, this is an element type. This is a style type. So they're different. So you can disambiguate. It's pretty cool. Um, and also, spec maintains very strongly that these keys should be described, specified, independently of their, the maps in which they're used. So you have key value pairs, you want, spec wants you to specify each of those key value pairs and explain them, describe them independently. And then later you can compose them into an associative structure like a map. So these two things together 
the map queue should be namespaced and they should be uh, defined and described independently of their context, it, it caused some problems for me. I'm going to show the code in a minute of some of the things I, I tried that didn't work. Uh, I can skip through this stuff. Uh, I have a couple of quotes from uh, some respect documentation that I thought were interesting just to sort of illustrate that these are the opinions that spec holds and sort of the underlying rationale for spec. So one of the problem statements is that map specs should be of key sets only. So Richie thought this is actually a big problem that frequently map specs are not just of key sets, that you're describing everything all in one place. And here's how he elaborated and he sort of started explaining why that's a problem. You're conflating the specification of the key set with the specification of the values designated by the keys, which I think I sort of understand. Anyway, uh, one of his objectives, therefore, which you know, corresponds to the problem, was let's decomplect maps keys values. Um, if you're not part of the cult, you might not be familiar with decomplect. It just means to decouple, basically. It's just, can we just say, can, you okay with that? More or less? Okay. Uh, I think it's a little clearer to understand. One of the objectives of spec is to just decouple them keep it and, and specify them all separately. And, and part of the explanation of that was let's keep the map specs separate from the attribute specs. That's how we explain it. So, again, y'all want me to skip over this part, I can. I thought it was kind of interesting. So, again, why does that matter? Um, one of the guidelines that was in the spec overview that I thought was notable was it sets maps are about membership and that's it. And by maintaining that constraint, we uh, get advantages in terms of composition and dynamicity. We retain those properties, the desired properties of composition and dynamicity. And uh, I'm not gonna try to explain why that is because I'm not sure I could articulate it, but uh, it feels right. And uh, you know, someone smarter than me can maybe explain it in the Q&A. All right, so let's look at the specifics what I tried to do that didn't work. Any questions? Uh, anything I missed? Yeah. In that previous slide, are we thinking of sets as kind of trivial maps? I am not sure sets? why. So the question was in this slide, why is it, say, sets, parentheses, maps? Yeah. Like, what aren't they different types of data structures? A set is a set, a map is a map. I don't know. I was hoping we could all sort of just kind of. You know, sneak past that. Anybody know the answer to that? Yeah, go ahead. I think that this is supposed to be a reference to the fact that you can merge maps and you can merge sets. The, the notion seems to be that you can define, if you have namespace keys, you can define structures that simultaneously can to multiple specifications and you can accrete specifications more meaningfully as opposed to having. Um, like a traditional Haskell Java style untagged field membership, where like you you only have one name and it must satisfy all the constraints that anybody ever applied to me if you intend to reuse the value of the form. I think that's the notion here, um, but I'm not really sure. All right, we're not going to turn this into one of those those sessions where we try to like read the mind of Richie from afar because I've been in those. Yep, I'm still recovering. more of those. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just don't invite me. <laughs> All right, so here's an example. This isn't the code I was actually working with, but I wanted to show an example. Is this readable? Uh, no, it's not, my, it's not me. It must be the Mac. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't have a battery. Why would that shut down? Is it the iPad? I don't know. I see it's not. It's this one. Keep going out, we can sort it out. Oh, it's, a, it's a Mac, it's not a battery. It's a Mac, but it's recording, it's like the mole zoom on the keyboard. Out. Plug in a keyboard and it's an escape. All right, I'll, I'll go grab There's a bit of keyboards right next to the desk over there. All right, so this is not my code, but I thought it would be helpful before we show my code to sort of just show an example of a lot of the uh, common kind of things you'll see when in those guides and there's tutorials and they say, here's how you use spec. And this is what I was using. I was trying to use spec and I was looking at the guides and looking at tutorials and trying to figure out what the hell to do. And you'd see something like this. So you have a CLJ file and at the top, as usual, <laughs> thank you. 
be kind to your computers. <laughs> as, as usual, at a Conjure file, you start off by just declaring your namespace. The namespace that you are defining and populating in this CLJ file. So this, I just made this up, this is a HUD uh, housing and urban development catalog. That's what this is, whatever. And then we have three specs. So the first spec is called cores. And the, uh, the predicate is, that it has to satisfy is that it has to be a screen. Um, the next one is description. And I messed that up just to know that. Pretend it's, pretend it's the same thing with string with a question mark. They're both strings. And then we have something interesting. So those are both attributes, just key value pairs, and they're not, they're not a collection. Um, but then we have a spec called building. And what this is, this is basically a map associated uh, collection. And we're saying that this is a set of keys that are required. Here we have two keys that are required, chords and description. And it's pretty straightforward, right? There's two attributes. We define, we define the attributes of both strings. I mean, so we're going to have a map called building that's going to have both of those attributes and they're required. Um, one of the things that's interesting, interesting here is double colons. So what's going on with the double colons? Why are they useful? So normal key, closure keywords have a single colon, and in fact, I think you could use a single colon and all this stuff might work. I don't know if spec actually enforces you to use a namespace, I'm not sure. But anyway, this is this is like how you're supposed to write spec with namespaces. So that's what this does. This these double colons just sort of are a shortcut to assign a namespace to your specs. And it sort of auto-expands to the current closure namespace. So we were in the namespace hud.catalog. So in the top example here, we've defined a spec with double colons, and it really just expands out to that bottom, and those are completely equivalent. It's just syntactic sugar. Does that make sense? It might be simple, it might seem simple, but I, I got tripped up on this. Yeah? Yeah, I think it's just, it's not that building instead of the Yes, thank you. That's a mistake. It should be hud.cat, the bottom line, should be hud.catalog. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll fix it. You know, version 2.0 would be so much better. Um, so if I had gotten this right, it would look beautiful, and it would say hud.catalog slash chords, because that would be equivalent. Is, it, it, is this make some sense, that even though it's messed up? OK. Um, so the double colons are handy, right? You don't have to do all this typing. You don't have to spell this redundant stuff on your, in your, in your file, on your screen. You just, it's concise, and it's great. It's nice, and it's super convenient. Except when it's not. So here's what I was trying to do. Here's what I tried to do. So I'm trying to specify my diagram, my, my, my big nested JSON YAML structure that associated that. Um, now this is it's tricky. I need to see where I need my laser pointer. Do we have the laser pointer? Or I don't know. Um, if I walked over here and pointed at the screen, would that be like bad for Portland or bad for the video? Anybody know? Is that, is that allowed? Sure. All right, so let me walk through what I did here. Okay, so I am, this is a single CLJ, CLJ file, and this is pretty weird. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to use the double colons, but I wanted, remember I have the type attribute. So I can't just use double colon type with a regular closure file with a single namespace because they would be resolved in the same thing. So I thought, oh, I'll just have multiple namespaces. Why not? Right? So I've got SC4C as a library I'm working on. So I've got a namespace called fc4c.spec. I'll define a spec called fc4c.spec name. So the namespace for this one is fc4c.spec, and then it's name and it's a string. Okay. Then I want to talk about elements. New namespace. It's perfectly logical, right? I just want a new namespace. So now I'll create a namespace called fc4c.spec.element. And I'll reference this other namespace, SFS. And we'll create a spec in this namespace. This is now fc4c.spec.element slash type. Now it's very specific. I have namespace my type attribute to the very specific, and it's very explicit. So that the type of an element can be either person or software system. Then I've got the style. So another namespace also has type. Because again, I couldn't think of another way to use double colon syntax to make this work. And also, 
I just wanted that one file. I didn't want to have 10 different fi uh, files, one for every uh, one of my namespaces, and one for every data structure, every like sub data structure. So I'm trying to describe a nested data structure. Ultimately, it's, it's really one data structure. I'm never going to be passing these things around on their own. I'm always going to be working with, almost always be working with a diagram, one thing. And I, and they, like, I didn't need a stream level of composability modularity. I, it wouldn't make sense for my project. I want a single file to describe all my data. How are you doing? Make sense? So, 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 so that's what I was trying to do. I was solve this problem. I want to have a single file, but I want to use double colons because everyone uses double colons and use that. Every single example of tutorial I saw said use double colons. So right, this, this, this does technically work. And then you have a diagram, and I brought together stuff. So in the diagram in space, you have elements, which is a collection of elements of, of this one. We have styles, unit diagram slash styles, which is a collection of styles. And then we have a diagram, the diagram in space, which is a, um, a map containing elements of styles. So you can see how sort of I've defined this map, and then I've defined this map, the element map, and then style map, and then I've created a top level map that defines a diagram and brings everything together. Hopefully. Uh, questions? Comments? Okay. Makes some degree of sense. Okay, well, let's, let's. So, this seemed to work, but I wasn't really happy with it. It was convoluted. I think it's convoluted. I think it's verbose, and it's very not idiomatic. In the closure community, almost always, it's one namespace per file. You have a single file that defines and implements a single namespace. That one to one correlation is idiomatic, it's common, it's a convention, it's, it's just. Uh, it's also like just simpler. This, 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 this people think tend to think that way because it's so common. You tend to think, but if you have a file, that's how a namespace. If you have a namespace, that can be found in one file. And this broke that. And it's also just really verbose. There's a lot going on here. A lot of requires and aliases, and it was pretty weird. All right, so then I tried something different. So. Let me explain what I'm doing here. This is this is a little better. Here we have uh, only a single namespace. We still have a single file. Everything's on one file. We have a single namespace. Let's see, of course, you have the same namespace as before the top level namespace. And I'm defining here. I'm defining a spec. But the difference here is I'm not using double colons anymore. I realized. I think actually one of my coworkers helped me realize that I just didn't need to use them. It's just in technical sugar, and it's optional in this case. It was tripping me up. And part of what tripped me up was I didn't realize somehow that the spec namespace doesn't have to exist as a closure namespace. They're they're completely they're, they're almost completely independent concepts. They just they're both kinds of namespaces. They're both namespaces, but they're in different con contexts. They're used for different things. And then just the double column thing. Well, it's convenient. It also kind of conflates and connects things that didn't, don't really need to be. So. When it works, it's fine, but when it doesn't work, it can be pretty confusing. So I think one of my coworkers helped me realize I didn't need to use double colons. I didn't need to define or declare a closure namespace for every spec namespace, for every namespace I wanted to use for my specs. So now I was able to simply just say, I'm just going to use the namespace that makes sense, makes sense to me to use and declare it explicitly. So you know, here's my root level name, and here are various attributes to make up elements. fc4c.element slash name, fc4c.element slash type, SC4C slash element, so root level, this is this is element. And here we have the style type. I just put explicit here. You know, no double colons. This namespace is just typed out. FC4C.style slash type. And there's no confusion. And there's no overlapping. There's no conflicts. And there's no multiple namespaces. Right, so to me, this felt like a big improvement. Are different the differences make sense? So um, I thought it was a big step in the right direction, but there was one weird thing here that I want to explain why I'm doing it, and then why I originally thought I needed to do it, and then I realized I didn't need to do it, which was an additional cruft. So the weird thing here is I'm copying a spec. You see here at the top level, I've got a top level spec called just that's in 4C name. It's like a generic name. And then over here in elements, I'm saying there's an element name, and it's really just a copy of 
for the FC Forcey name, and then I'm defining a style name that's just a copy of the FC Forcey name. And, you know, and they get, those, those get composed together. So an FC Forcey element is composed of an FC Forcey element name, and then an FC Forcey element type, et cetera. And so at first I thought I didn't do that, do that. and later I realized I didn't need to do that. Let me explain why. Try to explain why I thought I needed it. This is where I highlight the weird things. Okay, so this is the origin data structure I get when I parse one of these YAML files. I got a, a, a YAML file containing the definition of diagram. I'm going to read it from disk or whatever, get it from wherever, network, who cares, and parse it. And now it's a closure data structure. So it's a map and it contains some nested uh, vectors or sequences which contain maps. And this is very similar to what we were looking at before. This is just an Eden, an Eden um, representation of the same YAML and JSON with the before. Just a partial, I think it's the same data. Does it, this make sense? But, so what this is just, this is the data that I'm dealing with. It's an example of the actual data I get when I parse a file. And so I thought I was going to need to do this. Again, I then realized I didn't need to. But at first, because I was, sorry, because I was low spec, I wasn't uh, fluent with it. I was just so new and I'd forgotten parts of it, I guess. And, I was only roughly familiar with it. I thought, okay, well, you're supposed to fully qualify your keys. So in my data, I'm gonna fully qualify my keys because that's the spec way, right? I'm gonna go all the way with this and really embrace it. So I'm gonna to have to make sure that my, my data, my, I get this, this uh, when I parse the YAML file, I get a map of unqualified keys, right? The, the keys don't have any spaces. And the only way you know that type is a style type versus element type is from context. That, that sucks, right? So let's let's not do that. And so I thought, in order to for my spec to be useful, to be able to validate this data structure and parse it and, and do things with it and generate it, I thought this is what the data structure has to look like. I thought I had to have a post processing step after parsing it and before conforming it, before validating it. I I got to add in namespaces. I've got to qualify all those unqualified keys. And so I, I imagine doing this. This is this is. So let's say I've got that one, uh, only one spec called name. Let's say I've only got that one spec called name. That's where that's c dot spec slash name. And so it's being used here. Um, here we've got s where dot spec slash tag. So we've got some. You can see these maps have a mix of different name spaces because really you shouldn't repeat yourself, right? So I thought okay, an element. This this is map represents an element. So I'll use the element type. I use a spec name because why should I repeat myself? But then I try to imagine the post-processing code that would take that, take this data structure, and know how to turn it into this, and know which namespace to assign to each key. And I thought, holy shit, like that is gonna suck. It's gonna be a disaster, you know. And like, and I think I was lucky enough to realize that. Maybe I'm going down the wrong path. You know, if, I, if I'm imagining myself writing this terrible code that makes no sense, it's going to be just awful just to do this. Like, yeah. So, is my thought process anybody? No? Yeah, okay, a few. few. All right. So, and that's, that's why I copied the specs. I copied name into element, the name, the, the name spec from the, from the root namespace into the element namespace so that when I did this post processing step, so I'm going to qualify all the keys in my data set. I can just have it be much more uniform. And I can just say, okay, this map represents an element. I'm just going to take that element namespace and apply it to all those keys. This map represents a style. Just apply it to all the keys. Apply it to style namespace. And I thought that'd be easy. And I thought, great. Now I can do what I need to do. Now that my data is properly namespaced and qualified and all that, now I can really use spec. Now I found the path to enlightenment. And then I realized, no. I got this all wrong. <laughs> so it turns out that was just really silly, and I just like didn't read the docs, basically. But you know, it happens to all of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, turns out spec that includes a way to describe a map with unqualified keys. You can so you can go in your spec and you can have qualified everything and you can be super precise and explicit and all that. But then your data, you don't have to do that. 
because maps like this, unqualified, these are so common, the authors of the spec said, let's make sure we support that so this isn't awful to use. That's, that's when I got to my final version where there's less duplication. It's the same thing. We have a single namespace. We have the explicit uh, namespaces in our specs. And now there's no more duplication. I'm just using composition. So when I define a element, an element spec, I say with the keys in this thing, it's got the FC4C name and the FC4C element type. Because I can just use whatever I want to use. And the key there is using this, this rec un, this rec un descriptor. So instead of saying rec, which I was doing before, I was saying, oh, you really have to have these specs, these keys in this map. Which means the qualified names, keys with these namespaces. Now I can say rec un. I'm requiring there to be these unqualified keys in this map. So spec, you know what these are, but when you see them in the data structures, you're going to see them without, without the namespaces and just deal with it. And that's a feature of spec, and it's in there. This is where I ended up with my spec that describes fairly large, somewhat large, nested data structure with a lot of key names that sort of, you know, uh, potentially conflicting with each other. This is what I ended up with. I'm pretty happy with this. I think we've got, we've got some composition, we've got some, and I'm able to do validation, I'm able to generate values using the spec, and I'm not doing any post-processing. You know, which I thought for a minute, for a couple of days, I thought I was going to do the post-processing. It's a whole bunch of code you don't have to write in order to test, you know, CPU cycles they don't have to use. So I'm happy about that. And, you know, this is the end result. I've got the spec that says, here's what that diagram is. It's a collection of all these unqualified keys. Um, and it's, it's really, the file, in the file, the full file, it's just, I think it's really straightforward now. It's just defining a bunch of things and then composing those things together. So I'm pretty happy with that. So I want to go into demo time, but before we do, any questions about what we're demoing or this path I took? <laughs> uh, Anything else I missed? You know, because I probably missed something else that I should have done or should have realized. I, I'm sure. Um, but we can. Yeah. I guess I was able to follow the last uh, couple of slides there. So in the diagram, you're using diagram uh, namespace for the elements. Yeah. Yep. But in the, so where is that look, defined? Look over here. Ah, uh, so at the bottom here. So the diagram itself is composed, it has a bunch of root level keys. Just like a bunch of root level keys that themselves, they're just, they're just, their values are just arrays. So the elements. Yeah, I didn't see the uh, yeah. plural there. Okay. I didn't walk through it. I just kind of skipped over it. Yeah, this is, this is where everything comes together. This is where I'm tying everything together and saying there's a diagram, at the diagram level, the root level, there's a, there's a, you know, project called elements. Um, and all it is is a collection of elements. This is like the, the root level element um, data structure, whereas this is not that. The sc 4 diagram elements is just um, a collection of, el of, of these element data structures. I mean, I have a question. Like, you know, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question, both to make sure people can hear it and to see if I heard it right. Um, I think you were saying that um, you, you have, there have been cases you found where there are some things you've had trouble doing with spec, has not been clear how to do, and you said therefore you're using the schema library instead, which is one of the predecessors, one of the earlier, and, and it's, still, it's still around, it's still good. Uh, uh, and one of the specific cases is when you'll have 
different uh, amount in certain circumstances, a certain set of keys have to be there, in certain other circumstances, certain different combinations of keys need to be there, and these are sort of mutually exclusive co combinations. Is that sort of? So there's a certain set of keys you define. You want a map to only have those keys, yeah. and no other keys are allowed. Yeah. And those keys are optional, yeah. but those are the only ones that are allowed. Yeah. Gotcha. I think it might be possible to do that in spec with a union spec. So first you'd say, here's my map. Here are the optional keys. So here are the keys that are optional. They might, they might appear, and if they do appear, here's how you know what to do with them, and here's what this map could look like. And then the, the one you're uniting, I would think the one you're uniting it with would be a predicate that would check the keys and see is there anything else? If there is, it fails. So you just write a function that just checks the list of keys against what this what, what's allowed and just say it's failed. So to, just to fill in some context here, one of the philosophies of spec is that maps should be open. And they should allow accretion. And sort of the philosophy, one of these strongly held opinions of spec is that, you know, so spec doesn't want you to do what, you're, what you want to do. And, you know, um, you can take it up if we're tricky. <laughs> but um, I think sometimes we just we want to do what we want to do. And we're, so, you know, we're going to do it anyway. And, and so I think it's possible to do what you want to do with spec. Maybe the union type with the, you know, the map, the keys with an optional opt. And then the, you know, the set, the, the predicate that checks the, checks the keys against the set, you know, that's allowed. Maybe that works. There are probably other ways to do it. Um, but you should have going against the grain of the library, you know. See, so it's a little awkward and a little verbose, but I think it would probably work. Anybody? Did I get that wrong? Yeah. Uh, so, one, you might just want to show the example of how to do uh, optional keys, so rather than just a call and correct, you have call opt. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the So, so does that make quite sense that I think you're saying why don't you just use opt? Well, that, that, yeah, that's all half of it. Then the other half is, well, I don't want anything other than these keys. And that's right. the point of contention, I think, uh, for a lot of people. But uh, spec tools that I mentioned before, the separate library, that has a conformer where you can just say, I want to conform this, and I also want to make sure that it doesn't have anything more than these keys. And that's a, a library that you can yeah, so that's a way to do this maybe more elegantly, more more concisely. But one of the things I like about spec is you can just sort of write arbitrary predicates and do whatever you want. You, know, you can just write a function. The function takes in a value and the function returns a boolean. Is valid or is not valid? You can write whatever logic you want. And you can write multiples and combine them together at an end. And I really like that a lot. I think it's sort of like an open system. And I tend to use that and sometimes abuse it. And I think that's well within my rights. And I'm happy to do that. I like that a lot. All right, let's, let's be, it's not an interesting demo, but I just I, I don't want to get up here and just show slides. I mean, I just want to prove that it does actually work, I guess. So bear with me. Oh, let's see. Oh my god. Now I've got to switch my monitor setup. A disaster. It's trigger, exactly. Thank you. Okay. Let me say when. Here. Um, here. Is that okay? People in the back. Well, people in the back. Benjamin, you're in the front. Come on. People in the back, can you see this okay? But then they can't see my pretty face. Okay. <laughs> so let's see what I've got. What I've got here. I've got, um, I just created a bar with this path to this YAML file. Right? It's just really long. YAML file with like, a lot of stuff in it. Is it the run of show real data and that like this thing really works? Uh, what else do I got? I, I, I required a bunch of things. Okay, so there's a spec called this is where I should put this here. I do have two hands. So you can show oh, 
Isn't that, isn't that what it's called? To get a spec? Just get? No, no. Is it get spec? Here. Who's your spec dot alpha? Right? Get spec. Can we do it? Yes, get spec. Oh, there it is. That's a spec. Sorry. I'm sorry. So there's a spec. It's beautiful. Uh, just to show that it exists, we've got um, enforcing dot diagram slash elements, etc. All this stuff exists. I don't know why I'm showing you that. It's not interesting. But what we can do, now that we have a spec, is, for example, one of the things we can do is what we call exercise. So let's say we want to get something. We want to get in style. Exercise will take a spec and you know generate new data from it using generators. It's all magic. It's all really cool. But basically, give you examples and make, make stuff up. So I just said, give me a style. I guess I got two styles for some reason. OK, whatever. That's strange. But you can see we generate a style. Here's another one. More style, lots of styles. You can generate an element. There's a very small element. There's a very big element. Great. Then we can generate a whole diagram. There's a whole diagram, lots of stuff. OK. So great, we've got the data structure. I can also yeah, so we can also do this. Let's see, we want to parse that uh, big YAML thing in that in that file there, and we're just going to get this big list of data structure. You know, this is just this is what it is. Um, so that's a real diagram, right, with real data in it, and we can. So what we're doing here is calling conform. So I'm, I'm taking the parse YAML, that's my, my diagram data structure, passing it to spec conform, and saying, hey, please conform this value against this diagram spec. And basically, uh, for those who aren't familiar, conform in a nutshell is like validate. Not quite, but pretty close. Make sure this is valid. Um, and if it's valid, it just returns the value back. Um, Although in some cases, I think maybe it'll kind of do some destructuring and take it apart and give you some pointers to it. Um, if you, especially, I'm not sure too much of that here. We'll give you the conformed version of the data structure, but you can tell if it's valid or not if it just gives you, uh, I think there's actually maybe a valid or validate, a valid question mark maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so let's do that, let's do that. If I want to, just, if I want to know if it's valid or not. It's like that, valid, okay. Oh, great. So. That YAML file contains a valid diagram according to this diagram spec. And that's the demo. And this is anything else anyone wants to see, that's the demo. It works. Uh, okay, demo time. We'll just bring this up full screen. Demo time. Uh, if there's any discussion, we can do that, but I just want a quick postscript. Just today, I was looking through the guide for spec. The, I guess it was the guide. And I found this section that I had not really noticed or I had skipped over before called multi-spec, which is sort of like multi-methods for specs. You can inject uh, some indirection and, and some logic into which spec to use and which situation based by inspecting, you can inspect your data and then decide using your own function, like your own dispatch, which spec to apply. And maybe that would have solved a lot of our problems here. I haven't fully thought it through, but I think maybe. So I just wanted to point out that um, this whole thing might have been a waste of time. You know, but 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 by wasting my time, maybe I've saved you all some time or some of you some time, right? Because I made all these mistakes and wasted all this time, and maybe I should just use multi spec in the first place. And if anyone has an opinion on this, I'd love to hear it because I haven't had a chance to really think it through. And so that's that's all I got. So thoughts? Yes. It's more of a leading question. If you want to show a new demo uh, where it fails to validate, then you can use explain to like, show how a spec can tell you. I, so the question was, do I want to show in my demo uh, an example of, of, of passing a, an invalid uh, val, uh, data structure, the diagram data structure, to uh, conform or to validate, or to validate and, and seeing what happens? And I was thinking no, because I was thinking like this isn't really about spec itself. This talk, um, like I was thinking, 
you sort of assuming that spec does this stuff, it validates and it works. And, and, and uh, I wasn't thinking much like demonstrating spec itself, rather some of the things I learned about how to structure how to model large and specify largeness data structures. But I mean, this is a user group, so if people want to see that, absolutely. Then we want to see what happens if you sort of have an invalid uh, data structure, and we can do that now, or we can do that work. Yes, yes, okay, all right, great, fine, great, cool, good idea. All right, so let's, let's get this into a bar. Okay, so now that bar contains our parsed, uh, parsed diagram. And now let's take, let's see, how should we change this? How should we screw this up? Okay, let's change the value of that scope, um, scope key to a, a, a number. So we can take this and you can say this value. So yeah, this thing we have now, it's true. What if instead, so instead we're saying, if we take that diagram when we replace the value of scope with a one, is that valid? No, it's not valid. Okay. Um, now in order to usefully uh, find out why it's not valid, I think we, we could call explain data we don't have to call it perform first, right? We can just call it explain data right here. Explain, just explain. Okay. Oh, we can start with like just explain it. Yeah, I haven't, I'm still, I'm still new with spec. It's definitely not on the tip of my time. There you go. So in scope, val one fails the spec, non blank string. It is not a non blank string. There we go. So we have an explanation. It's sort of like computer ease, right? And that's why there's a great library called expound that will give you human, readable, friendly, you know, English error messages. It'll take this crap and extend, it'll actually take, a, I guess, it'll take this crap, right? Yeah, there's the problems. It takes the problems as data, which is in here somewhere. And it'll give you a useful error message in English. So if, if you're using spec and doing validation, I highly recommend checking out Expound. They recently added, um, or they're or about to ship maybe, a new feature where it'll, it'll oh, so if you're using uh, Closure Specs generative testing facilities, so there's a uh, spec test namespace and there's a check function, and you can, you can ask it to check your function definitions, your function specs, and uh, if something fails, you get back a ridiculous amount of data that it's incredibly hard to understand. And so Expound recently added support for that. So now you can build it into your testing and your generative testing. Oh, I'm doing generative testing here. Anybody wants some generative testing? I'm pretty happy about that stuff. I'm sure they're both right. Um, let's see. Let's see. Yes. Um, How would a function spec, a function spec would use the closure namespace, right? And then the name of the function. So I've got, nope, all right, good. Well, let me just show one of my, one of these things. Nice. So I've got here a function called blank nil or empty, just a predicate, and I give it a value, and it tells me whether or not it's blank or nil or empty, which seems silly. It's probably silly, but I found it useful. And here is a function definition that specifies the behavior of this function. It describes the arguments, what, what, what kinds of values should those be, describes the return value, that should be a Boolean. So this is where you start getting documenting your functions, which I love. I mean, so, you know, you can just have args in, in rep. You've already, that's great documentation. And then you can also have a, 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 a function, function that validates your function, which makes sense, right? Function, function that validates your function. 
But um, this uh, you supply a function that will get past the inputs to your function and the outputs it returned, and then you can do whatever you need to do to make sure that the inputs and the outputs, the relationship between them is correct. You can do whatever you want. And I think that's super cool. And because you combine this stuff with generating values, uh, uh, spec dot test will use closure dots dot closure dot what's it called? Closure dot check. No, what's the one? Test check. Test check. Thank you. Test check to generate a ton of great values that it can then throw in there and see, you know, do the specs still hold or not? So I'm pretty happy about this. It's not that like um, interesting to see it run, but we can do it anyway. Uh, it's been a while since I ran these tests at the REPL. It's been a, like a month, so I'm going to just run them here at the command line because that's oh, just so my fingers. So this is going to find those. I have six function definitions so far. I'm going to have more soon. It's going to find all six of them. It's going to generate thousands of values. Uh, that all should be valid, and pass them into this function and see if what it gets back matches those function specs. And some of these are a little slow. Uh, I've got some of them. I think I've got uh, constrained. We can hear this. This one here has to generate an entire diagram, uh, and it will be really slow to generate and invalidate an entire diagram. It's massive data structure a thousand times, which is the default. So in this case. I specified only do that 300 times. I think that number out of nowhere, but it's a lot faster than, three, than a thousand times. Okay, so it works. So I'm excited about this because this is all this is all the test code I've written. This is in my tests, but I've got a significant amount of coverage, and I think it's way more effective than traditional uh, unit tests, which you might think of as example tests. I think this is, you know, less work and more value, a lot more bang for your buck. Yeah. So just to get it straight, the tests you're doing are generating from the specs, mm -hmm. things they input into your the specs or the specifications you have for the function expectations. Mm -hmm. Like that F depth and all that stuff. Yeah, so exactly. So just wanted to confirm what's happening here. So yeah, so when I call um, where was I? Check and I say, hey, go ahead and check this function, this uh, function spec called process, or this function called process, uh, or let's say like nil or empty. I mean, let's let's look something that's like slightly interesting. So parse chords is, is something that's slightly interesting. Um, so we have here we're saying the arguments to parse chords should be there's only one. We're going to call it S, some kind of tag, and the guy that that thing should be it should it should be an instance of or an example of this step called the coordinate string, and so coordinate string is specified in a certain way. I think we can find it up here at the top here. Coordinate string is a string from a regular expression, so it's specified here a regular expression, and basically, um, test check is going to generate a, a thousand. Values and sort of, I guess it's sort of random. There's a lot of randomness in there, and the whole point is to sort of like find cases where your function will break and not do what it's supposed to do by by creating crazy or weird. So you know, the strings. A lot of the times, the strings are pretty crazy. Um, it's kind of fun sometimes to see what you get. You know, and I like it because you're like, you know, it's like what are they in some communities, uh, programming communities? I think they call it fuzz testing. Is that related? Anybody know? Sort of related. I'm seeing nodding. It's sort of related. I think I can. I'll go with that. I'm. I'm okay with that. Um, so if we this is annoying. Sorry. So now we can. Yes, Jen, is Jen, Jen is in there, right? Yeah, just as we can do exercise. Uh, just have string tag. That might work. No? Yeah, there we go. So 
I gave the string predicate as my spec because in spec any predicate is is a valid uh, well not any predicate any predicate is a valid spec but doesn't necessarily have a valid generator but a lot of the most of the functions in the core library do have valid generators attached to them so that there's a valid generator attached to this so basically it knows how to generate values and it's going to try to do all sorts of weird things we'll see sometimes there will be I mean it, it does at least do like emoji and all that sort of stuff which is you know, awesome I think we should maybe wrap this up. Um, I think, you know, it's pretty late. So why, why don't we continue the discussion outside of this situation where I'm holding everyone hostage? Cool? All right, thanks everybody.